Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On this beautiful Tuesday, no, it's not Tuesday, it's Sunday, March 8, 2015. And you're watching the Minority of One report with Desiree Rover from the Netherlands. I'm a medical research journalist and I went into the rabbit hole and found all sorts of things. And on my travels, I met Lorraine Moray, my guest of tonight. And she is a very special lady. She is a geoscientist, an anthropologist, an archaeologist, a historian, and a nuclear whistleblower. So, Lorraine, welcome, welcome. And, and um, happy National Women's, International Women's Day today. Oh, is that so? Okay, yeah. they made it for us, especially. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I can congratulate you on your birthday right now because you had that two, three days ago. And yes. yeah, I did that by mail already, but I want to do it like this again also. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Larry, on the, in the background with Loren for all the technical support. He's waving. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I will wave back. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, Loren, so many things happened. Um, you sent me a whole list of things that are um, in relation to Fukushima, which is something that is still going on and getting worse by the day. Yes, we yes. can talk about that. But um, maybe it's nice to start with the latest piece of news that you gave me. Uh, I had missed it, but... Um, it seems that Putin put an end to all the garbage going on in, in Ukraine. Um, tell me, what happened? What does this, uh, this martial art artist do? Well, this is uh, March the 8th, uh, 2015. And what I noticed um, in watching the news every evening on uh, developments in the war zone of eastern Ukraine, it's called Novo Russia or New Russia, and it's two oblasts or regions uh, together. It's called Donbass, and uh, the uh, separatist movement there um, did not want to live under an illegal. Uh, government, uh, which the legal government was overthrown one year ago. And uh, the CIA, of course, planned this during the Cold War. In fact, it was Dick Cheney and uh, Victoria Newland uh, was hired by him. It was probably her first job. And uh, this is years ago. So um, there's been a uh, uh, war going on uh, between the um, the resistance the resistance in eastern Ukraine. These are Russian speaking ethnic Russians. Well, in fact, everyone in the Ukraine is Russian anyway, and they all spoke Russian until the Bolsheviks made up a language and called it Ukrainian in order to to split the population into a, into two opposing sides. They could play off against each other. So the um, militia, many of them are Cossacks. Those are traditional Central Asian equestrian warriors uh, that have taught the whole world how, how to fight wars because they've been doing it for at least 20,000 years. And um, they're settled in this area. In fact, um, uh, Empress Catherine, the Empress of uh, Russia, uh, granted them this land in perpetuity. And this is where the famous Potemkin villages are. Uh, I think most people know the stories about the Potemkin villages and um, uh, Cat Catherine the Great. And so, um, so the... Um, the Russian president, President Putin, um, even though they don't live in uh, the actual boundaries of 
the Russia of Russia, the Federation of Russia, uh, under the Russian Constitution, the the head of Russia is mandated to protect Russians even outside of the boundaries or the border of the state of Russia. And um, of course, the main uh, danger uh, for maybe the last 20 years has been a new Cold War starting uh, because the countries that are members of NATO and this basically is sort of the um, the Western economy. It would be Europe, uh, North America, and Japan. So they have been um, drooling or coveting the vast oil and gas depart, uh, deposits that rich, rich, rich uh, uh, natural um, wealth of, the, of Russia, and even Madeleine Albright and Hillary Clinton said to Putin, well, no country should have this much oil and gas. It's not fair. And um, so the it's not just uh, Hillary Clinton and Madeleine Albright representing the U.S. It's the New World Order who really wants control of those oil and gas deposits in, in the Siberian region, mostly of Russia. But now uh, Putin has claimed the Arctic region for Russia. This is an open ocean. There's no continental material there, uh, geologic formation. But any country um, claiming mineral wealth uh, in the Arctic or the Antarctic must demonstrate that they have a geologic structural connection to that region. And um, uh, Russia would have um, most of the claim on the, the mineral wealth of the Arctic. And that makes Russia the largest oil and gas holder of natural deposits in the world. Now, um, the United States needs wars. Our economy is based on wars, wars and the Anglo-American Permanent War Crimes Racketeering Syndicate is uh, very interested in that oil and gas that belongs to Russia. So um, American Vice President Biden and U.S. State Department uh, Secretary, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry have uh, initiated, um, they've, they've initiated uh, this war and heated it up in, in uh, eastern Ukraine by these Cossacks and, and volunteer militia. There are about 35,000 of them. And um, Putin does not want a war or to be involved in a war in the Ukraine because it would destroy the Federation of Russia. It would weaken his country and break it up because it's sort of a loose um, um, partnership of, of, um, of, of countries or former countries. And it's not as strong as the Soviet Union was. So he did everything to avoid a conflict in uh, the eastern Ukraine. And this situation is different from the Crimea. In the Crimea, the people held a referendum and voted almost unanimously, 97% or 85% of the population voted to join Russia. So that was self-determination. The United States had nothing to do with it. Russia had nothing to do with it. It was what the the, the Crimean people wanted. And um, when the eastern um, Ukrainian area, the region of Donbass, declared their opposition, their resistance to being under this illegal junta, and they also um, did not like Chevron and um, Royal Dutch Shell fracking in their, their lands which belonged to them. 
because Catherine the Great gave it to them. So um, about 50 of them picked up Kalishnikovs and started fighting. And there's been a war going on. More than 50,000 people have been killed in the last year, and most of them were civilians. In fact, in one of the early battles, which the militia lost, it was the battle for Ilovas, uh, two-thirds of the population there, two-thirds of the people there were killed by the Ukrainian government troops. Um, that's a lot of people. I mean, can you imagine how empty that city is now? So the, uh, the militia or volunteer army of the, um, the people of uh, the citizens of eastern Ukraine withdrew and um and then the the war the war started again and as the war progressed uh the militia because they're very skilled fighters they kept circling the um ukrainian troops and taking all their equipment away all of the planes the uh, they shot all the planes down like in about a month with shoulder missiles and um, they didn't really have any equipment, just these old Kalishnikovs. But once they started surrounding the Ukrainian military and taking their equipment, my God, one year later, they have uh, almost enough equipment for an army of 100,000 people. And indeed, they are recruiting now uh, for volunteers to join the militia. And they're getting 200 people a day coming into their recruiting centers and signing up to be in the militia. They've also had foreigners come, uh, Serbian, Spanish, French, a uh, Brazilian, uh, people, uh, uh, Turks, all kinds of people have come to help them, even Afghanis. And it's because um, many people are aware that the Ukraine symbolically represents the return of fascism and the Nazis to um, the public um, the public view and this is all over Europe and and uh, we we're, it's starting in the United States now uh, so a lot of people are helping as well and uh, because the militia have been very good to prisoners of war the Ukrainian soldiers who are prisoners of war, um, some of those former prisoners of war have been collecting humanitarian aid to bring to the city of Ilovas or cities where they were prisoners of war and treated well instead of being killed and tortured. So now they're coming back, whole battalions from the Ukraine with thousands of tons of food and medicine to uh, bring on a regular basis out of gratitude to the citizens of Nova Russia who helped them. And I think across um, the Ukraine, people are beginning to realize now that they're all the same people, that this shouldn't be happening to people who are really their brothers and sisters. And um, so there are separatist movements popping up all over the Ukraine. It's an epidemic now. And there is a very strong partisan movement that's growing and insisting on um, uh, separation from the Ukraine also, or, or wanting it. So what's happening is uh, Putin refused to get in, involved in a war. He used diplomacy at the United Nations, with the EU, in Brussels. Uh, in different court cases and so forth. He's been registering war crimes with the UN Security Council. And of course, there will, there will be lawsuits at the International Criminal Court. And uh, the US is very much behind this. Joe Biden, Vice President Biden's son, is on the board of directors for uh, the Shell Oil Company contract and the Chevron contracts, and also John Kerry through his stepson uh, has links to 
these contracts. And just a couple of days ago, the militia were cleaning up areas of uh, Nova Russia or Donbass that have been um, occupied by the Ukrainian troops for a year. And they found seismic uh, trucks and seismic exploration equipment. I mean, a lot of it in a camp that the Ukrainian National Guard had been guarding so they could do their seismic exploration and fracking uh, during the whole last year. Uh, no one even knew about it. So you see, this is about natural resources. Monsanto also is grabbing land all over the Ukraine. They're very, very rich farmland. They have 35% of the black soil, the best soil for agriculture in the world. They have a third of what is available or what is uh, naturally there um, globally. So the Ukraine is a very, very rich uh, agricultural producing region that feeds Europe, and it's also the largest country in Europe, even though it's in Eastern Europe. And it's always been part of Russia or the Habsburg Empire. They've only been free and um, their own sovereign nation for 23 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the minute they got their sovereignty, um, the criminal oligarchs and the mafia and the, the underworld jumped into the Ukraine to steal and loot everything they could. So, um, the decisive battle was um, around the period of February 8th. It lasted for a, uh, maybe a month. And finally, the militia completely surrounded 8,000 Ukrainian troops and they could not get out and nobody could get in with supplies or, or ammunition or anything. And um, the um, militia offered safe passage for 8,000 Ukrainian soldiers to leave that area and return to their region and, um, and their camps. And the condition was that they put their arms down and leave all of their military equipment there. All the trucks, tanks, APCs, everything, uh, big artillery. And the Ukrainian soldiers refused to do that. There was no way for them to get out, but they still refused. And um, this is about the fifth time this has happened in a year. So um, the, the militia were really running out of patience because all of the infrastructure um, in the war zone has been destroyed by them. They've shelled and bombed and missiled and mortared uh, and murdered, mortared and murdered of uh, the whole population there. So um, when they refused, the Ukrainian government troops refused to leave that war zone. It's called the Dibalt Savo Cauldron up in the north region of Donbass, um, the militia had no choice because uh, these Ukrainian troops were underground. They were uh, in basements of houses and apartment buildings. They were snipers everywhere. And um, it was very dangerous for both sides. So the militia um, had no choice but to, you know, to neutralize them. And two buildings in Debaltsevo, which is a big city in that region, had to be blown up because it was too dangerous to enter and remove the Ukrainian troops who were entrenched there. And in the end, the Ukrainian troops kept trying to break out or break through the militia lines. And um, so about 6,500 of the 8,000 soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers there, uh, 6,500 were killed. And finally, 
after this nightmare has gone on for a year, uh, finally Putin put his foot down and it was the Ukrainian military who has asked five times for ceasefires and all they did was bring in more equipment, more soldiers, more weapons, more advanced weapons, and um, and they it drew in the EU, it drew in NATO, it drew in all the countries around the Ukraine, it drew the US in, they were all providing weapons and money and everything to the Ukrainians as the Ukrainian economy, uh, they're bankrupt. They had no gas or heat for months this winter uh, to heat the country. People have been living all over the Ukraine without heat almost all winter or hot water. And um, so finally put, Putin put his foot down and I suddenly noticed that the Ukrainian soldiers, because it's a ceasefire, uh, they agreed to to pull their all their military equipment and guns and everything back a certain distance from the front line. Well, they refused to do it, even though they asked for the ceasefire. But the militia removed all of their equipment back to what the agreement was, and um, the OSCE, which is part of NATO, has been supervisor supervising and reporting on what's happening there and um, they um, they just said they were not satisfied with the Ukrainian troops they reported that to um, a number of agencies and uh, and so what happened is Putin went to Obama I guess last week and he said if you provide lethal weapons to the junta in Kiev, I will send my army straight to Kiev and we will take it over. And then he told the European Union that if they keep causing trouble there and if the, if the uh, Ukrainian army continues attacking cities in in Donbass, then he would withdraw all the funds that Russia has in the EU in mar marketing and trading and everything. It's $700 billion, which would bankrupt the EU. So suddenly I was looking at the news this morning and um, uh, Russia and Putin have said that they are now ready to recognize officially that Donbass or Nova Russia is independent of the Ukraine and that they're sovereign nations. It's uh, two oblasts or regions that have uh, withdrawn from the Ukraine or they were trying to. And um, so they will become part of Russia eventually. And, um, and now the Kiev junta and the Ukrainian government has to deal with a partisan uh, separatist movement that spread all over the country. And um, uh, basically the president of the Ukraine, Poroshenko, and the prime minister, Yeltsin Yuk, have been going to the US, to the UN, to the EU, any place they can go begging for um, uh, peacekeeping uh, missions to come in to monitor the eastern Ukraine war zone, but really what they want is the peacekeepers in in the Ukraine to protect them from this uprising now that it's spread all over the country. So it, it has blown in up into their faces, big, big, big time. Big time, and it, it bankrupted the EU, it bankrupted NATO, um, it had an economic impact on the United States, and we're all already the biggest debtor in the world. But you know, it's all funny money. It's just yeah. made up. It's it's uh, as as President George W. Bush said, Wall Street is voodoo economics. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 
So that's the state of it now. And um, I just noticed for the last three or four days that the militia were so happy. And I knew something big had happened because they have fought so hard. They have endured so much. So many of them have died. But the kill rate, uh, because they're very skilled as traditional warriors for thousands of years, it's genetic in them. And um, they're very careful. They're respectful. They're happy all the time, even in the battles that are the worst battles of all. And they've treated the prisoners of war so well um, that actually people all over the Ukraine have a new awareness and tremendous respect for them. So uh, I believe that uh, this is going to turn out well for the people of the Ukraine because uh, Putin and Russia are strong enough to pull them out of this huge a uh, pending, looming uh, international monetary fund and uh, World Bank debt that this junta got them into. And uh, um, Monsanto has been grabbing land all over the Ukraine to grow GMO food on. And Russia doesn't want GMO food and neither does Europe. Um, and the uh, Monsanto, of course, is owned by the Jesuits. So uh, beyond the EU and the Western economy and the U.S. and, and, um, and what's going on, Russia, um, it's the Jesuits at the top who are causing all this trouble and um, genociding these people. And the Ukraine has been genocided four times in the last 100 years. This yeah. isn't the first time they've been through this. And look what happened to Russia. The Bolsheviks were sent there by the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this this um, is turning out very differently, and it's going to protect Russia from NATO invading all of the border states around the Russian, the sovereign Russian nation. Uh, NATO's been in, 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 uh, encroaching on them for the last twenty or thirty years, and. Uh, NATO is bad news. And yeah, NATO, NATO basically is the army of the New World Order, isn't it? It is the army of the New World Order, that's correct. Yeah. And um, they did horrible things in Haiti to the Haitian people after that horrible earthquake. Um, they're an occupying army. They are uh, land grabbers. They are fascists. Uh, they're Nazis, actually, in fact, and because they're there to impose their will and their agenda over uh, weaker, weaker nations and weaker people, and um, that's no self-determination. That is uh, uh, them having the divine right to rule over anybody they want to, basically. Yeah. So I think Russia is stronger because of the sanctions against it, stronger because uh, their uh, reliance on the Ukraine, for instance, for much of their material, uh, their mi mi military hardware has ended, and they are going to produce all their own military hardware internally in Russia, which is a much uh, safer thing to do. But all of the um, arguments and the fighting over um, the gas transit through the Ukraine, the Ukraine traditionally keeps stealing the, um, the Russian gas that is under contract to be delivered to Europe. They already had uh, a reduction and were getting their gas very cheap, but they wanted it for free. So three times in the last six years, Putin has had to turn the gas off in Ukraine, which is really the gas for Europe, uh, because Ukraine was stealing all of it. So it's been a nightmare, and um, it just made um, Russia more uh, self-sufficient and uh, more independent, and they're on a much better path of uh, strength and sovereignty now than they were before. Yeah. And... Um, it has uh, just destroyed the reputation of Kerry 
I think he was planning to run for U.S. president the next election. He'll never run now. He made such a mess in the Ukraine and destroyed his own career. Thank God, because uh, he's really a very nasty man. And uh, what this means is that um, in this transformation, uh, if this is what happens, I mean, they still have to walk the walk to get there. Uh, But if Ukraine is federalized into the federal uh, Ukraine, then the, the World Bank debt, these debts to the IMF and to the World Bank um, are not transferable to this new nation. So let's pray for them and send good energy to the people of the Ukraine and the people of Russia, because the people of Russia have also provided humanitarian aid to the people of Donbass. They're all Russian anyway, and uh, they all spoke Russian until the Bolsheviks introduced this eubonic Ukrainian. And um, let's hope for the best for a better outcome because they represent the hope of the world. Yes. Uh, the hope of people like you and me and, and people all over the world uh, to not be forced into a world, one world government slave um, future. We will all be slaves to the one world, one world government and the new world order. And another thing that is involved in this is that um, it's also a religious war because of the Eastern Russian Orthodox Church and the Eastern uh, Orthodox Christians withdrew from uh, Christianity. There was a schism in in, um, maybe a couple thousand years ago. And the... um, that, that part of the Christian church refused to be under the Pope, submit to the Pope in Rome. So they uh, relocated to Constantinople, which today is Istanbul, and they built beautiful, beautiful Christian churches. And um, I think most people don't realize that the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, which included Constantinople, did not collapse until the end of the 1400s. So uh, when the Roman Empire collapsed in the eastern part, um, this is uh, this was um, uh, very significant. Uh, well, anyway, the the um, the Eastern Orthodox Christians in Russia came from Kansas. Constantinople and relocated to Russia. The Ukrainian, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Greek or- Eastern Orthodox Church, however, did go under the Pope. So they are under the Jesuits. The Eastern Russian Ukrainian, I'm sorry, the Russian Eastern uh, Orthodox Church is not under the Pope. And the new world order, this one world government that the Jesuits want, they also want one world religion. So they staged and organized and carried out the Bolshevik revolution to kill a hundred million Russian Eastern Orthodox Christians. That's what the Bolshevik revolution in that, that communist period was about. So they annihilated them between World War One and World War Two, and now this war in Russia, in the Ukraine, is also a war against the remainder of the Russian Eastern Orthodox Christians who are in the Ukraine. And uh, then there's a diaspora of white Russians around the world, but not so many. And uh, so this is a genocide of people of all non-Catholic religions who refuse to submit to the Pope. Yeah, it's always... Very complex. It's very complex. There are so many layers in these happenings, yes. 
Um, there was, a, a, I heard someone say on a uh, American uh, internet radio station that Putin had satellite images of what happened at 911 and that he was hanging them <laughs> like this sort of Damocles over the head of uh, Obama. He was blackmailing the U.S. government. He was black making, blackmailing the politician elite and the, the intelligence agencies involved in 9-11. And um, we haven't heard that much out of them. We haven't seen the pictures yet either. But he's just letting the whole world know that he's got a library. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And documentation on dirty deeds all over the world. He's been warning other countries too, and um, it's just it's just criminal oligarchs, criminal politicians in uh, public places who are looting and genociding and stealing everything from every country. It's not just third third world countries now; it's developed countries too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And. Um, He's just letting them know that um, there's going to be criminal consequences uh, to them if they don't back down from this absolutely insane plan that they have for one world government. They want to destroy all nation states. Yes. And he has started a movement to re sovereignize uh, countries around the world. So they would have their own currency. They would have their own sovereignty. They would have the, the power of self-determination. And this has always been a battle, but especially with the Jesuits. And before the Jesuits, the Jesuits are just rebranded. Those people at the top who control the Jesuits and who have ruled the world for two or 3,000 years are Iranian tribes from Central Asia. And those Iranian tribes set up, well, the Farnese family set up the 12 key Etruscan cities that started civilization in Italy. And those cities were razed to the ground and they started the Roman Empire. Well, when the Roman Empire collapsed, they started the Habsburg Empire to reassemble the Roman Empire through intermarriages. And they had such a careful, um, uh, very, very uh, structured, very, very goal-focused um, uh, breeding program within the Habsburg uh, royal family that they were marrying uncles to nieces and first cousins to each other uh, to consolidate the land that originally made up the Habsburg that the Roman Empire, and they they recreated it as the Holy Roman Empire under the Kaiser. Well, Kaiser is the German word for Caesar, and Tsar, the Tsar of Russia, is the Russian word for Caesar. So we still have this heavy echo, this substructure, this mentality, this culture of the Roman Empire that is still running things. Yeah, yeah, and by way of the Jesuits right now. Yeah, the Jesuits, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I am very curious about how in the Netherlands the news of uh, the Ukraine and Putin's uh, victory, so to speak, um, will be broadcast to us, because I don't know what spin they will put to it, but I don't think we will hear the truth here. Well, no, and of course that goes back to the, the history of the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands today are under a very fascist uh, royal family. Um, I was shocked the first time I went to Amsterdam. I said, these people are a bunch of Nazis running around. And I don't mean the people of the Netherlands, the citizens. I'm talking about a layer, a controlling uh, network of people with common interests. And um, 
They're interested in huge drug racketeering. There's a huge, huge, huge economy of drug racketeering that the yeah. Dutch royal family is involved with. Yeah. And the Dutch uh, East India Company was started by the Jesuits. So it's the Jesuits who um, are this fascist element controlling the Netherlands. And they're not even religious. They're atheists. They don't believe in God. They're a military organization headed by these ancient Iranian families who have also had very careful breeding programs. And they don't allow intermarriages within the Jesuit, the popes of Rome, who are Jesuits, basically. They're, they're the Iranians. They um, did not allow intermarriage of royal families in Europe with anyone they were, were related to in any way in the last seven uh, generations. That is a concept that comes straight from the tribal practices of Central Asia to keep their tribes healthy and viable and, um, and to guarantee um, their, their survival. When yeah. they when they did this breeding program, the popes of Rome with the Habsburg Empire, they gave permission for Habsburg royal families to intermarry first cousins, uh, uncles to marry their nieces, and so forth, which guaranteed that these these bloodlines would die out, and none of those bloodlines lasted more than two hundred years. They would die out, they were infertile, they had horrible birth defects and mutations, all kinds of problems, mental illness. And um, But the, these Iranians running the Jesuits at the top, and they were sitting in um, the Vatican as the popes of Rome, it was Pope Paul III, Alejandro Farnese, who started the Jesuits in the 1500s, and they spread. In the, this is in the age of exploration and started colonies all over the world. They were the Jesuits had missions in Vietnam in the 15 or 1600s and India and Japan and um, Southeast Asia. So they've been there a long time. And the Vietnam War was actually, it was about drugs and it was about opium, of course, but it was also to convert the southern part of Vietnam, which was Buddhist, to Catholicism, like the northern part had been converted in the in the 1600s. And now we see the same thing happening in Thailand. This is part of Obama's pivot to Asia. The Thai uh, royal family has been uh, overthrown by the military. There's been a military coup. And um, this is to convert the Buddhists in Thailand to Catholicism. So they can wage war also. <laughs> so that they can dominate uh, the whole Southeast Asia through religion. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so it's different layers of people and interests all operating in, in at their level but it's all for a big master plan that fits together very carefully. And that is the one world order, the one world government. And the Italian families, these families, not just Italian, but these families who are Iranians, and you can look at them and tell, um, are the Farnese family. And um, they were popes of Rome, but Pope Paul the III's um, I think it was his son. He had children before he went to the Vatican. Was Pierre Luigi Farnese, and he was sent to the Netherlands to um, put down. Uh, there was a Catholic and, and Protestant revolt or some problem there, and he was sent to um, the Netherlands by the the uh, Habsburg Empire to control that that situation and um and then the pope paul the third built the villa farnese which is an octagonal building no pentagon and it is actually the um 
the architectural structure that the Farnese's built in Washington, D.C. after they burned it to the ground in the War of 1812. And uh, these people at the top of the Jesuits are Zoroastrians. They worship Mithra. And there are symbols all over Washington, D.C. of Mithra and Zoroastrian and Sumerian symbols that started giving me clues about why are those there? There has to be a reason. And then I found out that the Farnese's own the Pentagon. They own Washington, D.C., most of the federal buildings. And Fidel Castro is a Farnese. He's from a ducal family that goes back to Paul III. Uh, they had three titles of Duke. The Duke of, um, they are the Dukes of um, uh, Castro. The Dukes of, um, oh dear, Piacenza and uh, Parma. And then they intermarried with the Spanish Habsburgs, but uh, Castro's father came from Italy, from a northern uh, area city where all of these Iranian families still live and intermarry. And those families are the Pallavicini, you know, uh, uh, Shah, Reza, Halavi, uh, well, he came from that bloodline. Okay. Um, uh, Stalin uh, was Persian. He was born, he was Iranian, and he was born in the southeast, southwest corner of the Caspian region, north of the Elbers Mountains. And um, he's Iranian. He was Iranian. So he was one of those bloodlines ancient Iranian bloodlines, and it's through the mothers. The mother is always the very most important part of a breeding pair. And uh, then I started looking up at the turf. I said, all these people um, lost their, uh, the, their uh, sovereign rulers, and they were replaced by presidents or uh, different, more modern governments. But all at the same time, around the 1920s, and I said, so was Ataturk Iranian, and my goodness, his mother came from the area, the region just south of where Stalin came from. <laughs> so um, it's uh, also the Elder Brandinis, the Gigi's who run the, the um, Vatican Bank, and of course Putin would be dealing with them, uh, with the BRICS, um, uh, the new BRICS banking system, which Putin is putting together. And um, it's, uh, it's a very exciting time to be following the news and to be involved in, in learning about these, uh, these huge, momentous world changes. We must not be afraid of them. We want to study them and learn about them and learn the history, the older history of these regions. And it's our history, too, and participate in this transformation it's like surfing the top of the wave instead of being under the wave yes. and yeah and so um i think the country that is in the most danger in the world now from this jesuit takeover is the united states and the chemtrails the radiation levels from fukushima that are being piped over here on uh uh, a natural atmospheric phenomena. Uh, it's horrendous, and the U.S. is going down so fast. I mean, you go into grocery stores, every time I go in, the food is more expensive and poorer quality, and the wrapping and, and packaging is cheaper and cheaper. Uh, we have Homeland Security everywhere. Uh, they are just the Jesuit Gestapo. They are controlling everything, all the food, the restaurants. Uh, they set up gang stalking. There's electronic surveillance equipment everywhere. There's mind control everywhere. Uh, this is in the San Francisco Bay Area. And one of the headquarters is the University of California at Berkeley, where they are training students from all over the world and all over America how to overthrow their own government. They are the students who were sent to the colored revolutions that overthrew, overthrew 
so many governments already. And the overthrow of the legitimate, democratically elected President Yanukovych of the Ukraine, who was overthrown a year ago, it was the over it was the Orange Revolution funded by Soros in about 2004 that Victoria Newland and the State Department and the U.S. government were behind it. And that was the beginning of the overthrow of the Ukraine and this horrendous mess that has been made uh, and has bankrupted the company, the whole country, and um, all their energy prices are going up. Uh, everything is going up in the Ukraine and the quality of life is going down, down, down. But there is hope on the horizon and that hope is Putin and the Russian people um, who uh, oppose this. Putin said a long time ago this New World Order stuff will never work. It will never work. And there are a lot of people who are going to get hurt, but it will never work. And he's right, and we're seeing it right now in the Ukraine. Yes, but we have to do some things to help this thing in the right direction. And when you say that we should study uh, the history of things, I cannot agree more than that, because that is where you start to see how all these lines and and patterns come together. Yes, and their templates, their templates yes. of Absolutely. war, their templates for making nuclear weapons, their templates for yes. social interaction, their templates for religion, and these Farnesis and these these Jesuit top Iranian families have just been pr pulling these templates out and using them repeatedly. Uh, through the eons and, and uh, through countries and, and wars and everything because they work. And they do it the same way every time. And yeah. for instance, the nuclear weapons program was developed by Austrians from the Vienna School. The Vienna School is a Jesuit headquarters for all of these horrible wars and everything that are happening that, that are headed for enslavement of humanity. And um, uh, the Jesuits, the Jesuits are uh, everywhere. They're all over the planet. But they have this uh, deep grid almost of, of hierarchy. Yeah, it is. It's a very rigid uh, hierarchy and it's very, very controlled. And there it's not a lot of people. There are many, many more people than than they have. So uh, we need to um, be aware of what is happening and to recognize these patterns because right away when you rec recognize a pattern or a template, you can begin reversing it or countering it. And education is the most important way to do it. The newspapers, the media is owned by the ruling class and the media is the most important way for the common people to maintain and to protect their democracy information the world turns on information well we're not getting information real information we're getting fairy tales yes. about how we think the world works and yes. it ties the very evil things that the new world order is carrying out and it's genocide in every country with nuclear materials with bioweapons secretly developed in universities with uh chemical weapons. The chemtrails are interacting with the um, the Fukushima radiation, which has yes. contaminated the entire food column of the world. Yep. I mean, well, the was... air column. And uh, we're in a massive die-out. There are people dying all over the Bay Area now. I, every day, when I talk to people or I go out, I hear about more deaths and I see more sick people. Okay, well, it's not that bad here yet, but I was appalled the other day. I was staying with a friend who has a new partner, and this man, he is very nice, but um, he is a PhD, but he thought that 911 has happened a lot according to <laughs> the propaganda. And 
really, I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my God. And since he is the partner of a friend of mine, I cannot tell him that he should investigate more because, yeah, well, um, it's a bit difficult. But he was so adamant that, you know, it couldn't be that, that, that governments are doing things like this. I mean, it's not possible, he said. And then I thought, well, we have some work to do still. Because... How can you help um, change the view? Um, yeah, by living it yourself. That's the only thing, because you can't change another person. He or she has to find out. And they can find out by, yeah, seeing what you're doing or writing or whatever. Well, you have to want to know. And you... Yeah. You become aware by, um, by, by listening and, and by learning what the right questions are to ask to take you to the answers that are the right answers. And that takes time. But there are people uh, in the alternative media like you, and thank you, Biggie, for supporting us and, and having this um, network for us to be able to present the information um, and and then just talking to people on buses or overhearing conversations or whatever way uh, information flows uh, we just need to keep putting out correct information and what I found Desiree I'm a scientist so I have a science-based blog about um, about what's happening in the world, uh, but with issues, other issues involved that are really part of it. It's all integrated. It's all involved in, and uh, it's all related. People get compartmentalized and they, they focus on one thing, like the feet on the elephant or the trunk on the elephant yes. or the size of the elephant, but they never see the elephant is in their living room. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, that is absolutely true. And when you point out to them that there is an elephant, they look at me at, <laughs> as if I'm crazy. Okay, yeah, I might be, but that is why I call this program the, of this show the minority of one report, because that is a quote from Gandhi. I'm not a Gandhi fan, but he this one he got right. He said, even if you are a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. The truth is still the truth. And you are covering the most important issue that is of the greatest interest to people, and that's health issues. And yeah. health issues are being horrifically impacted. Our genetic future is being destroyed by these psychopaths and by these programs, these agendas, the chemtrails and everything that are global. And Excellent. Our government voted to make it legal to spray their own citizens with pernicious poisons that are deadly and cause deaths and illnesses, and the citizens didn't even know about it. No, and that goes for vaccinations as well, because everybody t will tell you that vaccines are safe and effective, and I know for a fact that that is not true. They're and brainwashed. They're just absolutely, brainwashed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you have to really trust somebody to have them inject stuff into your body. I mean... Um, you don't need anything injected in your body. No, of course not. But if, you have, if you have a healthy immune system from a proper diet, uh, they're poisoning our food. They're removing yeah. nutrients from it that are essential. And yeah. um, horrible things. And just yesterday... Um, I picked up a newspaper, and now our wonderful Congress in Washington, D.C., oh. which, which is 10% uh, of them are Jesuit trained. Obama is Jesuit trained. All seven of his intelligence agency heads are Jesuit trained. The Jesuits, tra the Jesuits have taken over the United States, and now in Congress, they have introduced a bill 
that is making it mandatory for all American adults to be on a vaccination program. Yes, I read that. Oh my gosh. That's what I mean when I say it's getting really crazy here. Yeah. And it's going to be worse than what is happening to the Ukraine. It's going to be far worse because there's no other country to help us. No. No, true. Yeah. And yeah. after all of the countries the United States has stolen their natural resources from, no wonder nobody likes them. Yeah, and that they hell have been fighting Israel's wars everywhere. I mean, they find oh, Israel. Oh. Israel couldn't even last a day without the huge amounts of money that are dumped into that that country. But the Jesuits created Israel. Mm -hmm. the created the Mossad. The great Jesuits created the FBI and the CIA in the United States. In fact, they took over the CIA in about 2002. Um, the Jesuits started MI6 and, and MI5. Um, so look at who the Jesuits are and where they are, but nobody even hears about them. No, and but there there is one thing that I'm wondering about. Um, it is also that Jews are everywhere in important positions, and they are 0.2 percent of the global population, but they're everywhere in command. Are they um, the Jesuit little slaves, or what? Um, the ruling. Jesuits are Iranians who originally came from Iranian tribes in the region of Uzbekistan. There were also Iranian tribes in the region that we call Tajikistan. And so the Uzbek Iranians took Tajik Iranians and they put them in a breeding program and they inbred them Um, in um, uh, ghettos and pogroms and things like that after they converted the Tajik Iranian tribes to satanic, Talmudic, Kabbalic Judaism, which isn't Judaism at all. It's, uh, it's like black magic. It's, um, yeah. it's a, a, it's a uh, perverted form of, um, of a death-worshipping religion. Yeah. If you want to call it a religion, they're a gang, basically. And so um, the Jews that we see today in the leading positions, for instance, in Homeland Security, taking down the United States and um, the Bolshevik Revolution and, uh, and uh, only 5,000 Jews are needed to completely control the whole city of London. They say that themselves. But these are Tajiks who were converted to the satanic form of Judaism, which is not what Judaism is. They, they follow the Torah. And, um, and they are um, mentally challenged. Um, I read an IQ article that said uh, uh, the average Japanese student has an IQ of 110. This is in universities uh, in America. It's about 107. And in Israel, it's about 95. Oh. So you see, they're mentally challenged. Um, their DNA says that they indicate that they came from uh, Central Asia, that they're Iranian. And, um, and then they're European Jews who are also satanic and Talmudic, who um, the precursors to the Jesuits and the Jesuits probably converted them to the satanic form of Judaism. And this is how they have spread all over the world. It's by a breeding program that they set up and they deliberately destroy and create these, um, these populations, victim populations. And uh, they are actually the victimizers. But uh, victimizers always turn themselves into the victims. Yeah. So that is the pattern. But when you look at Jude Jewish culture, the 
the satanic ones, when you look at um, their physical features, you can see an Asian um, look to them. And they uh, structurally, the women are more important and they have a lot more power in uh, decision making in uh, Jewish families than um, the the non-Jewish women. I'm talking about America. Um, white women in America, modern women in America, um, they they don't have a lot of freedom. They don't have a lot of privileges. They don't have the power until they become widows and they have money. Then they're allowed to have power and money. But um, and American women are very, very controlled. It's not. It's not uh, a whole lot of fun. But yeah, Jewish women. I had a Jewish friend, and she told me that she couldn't get a divorce because if she did, then everything she owned would go to her ex-husband. Right. And I thought, well, this is a bit uh, overdone. Until I saw a television program in how that is going on in Israel, where a, a man can go to the rabbi, rabbi and say, well, I don't want to have his wife anymore. And then he just walks off. And the woman stays with the kids and gets nothing. And the guy, uh, well, tries, all, tries it all over again with somebody new. It's well, amazing. That's a, that's a, a victim population that is practicing um, their satanic beliefs. And you see it's not good for their tribe to, for that to happen. They are abandoning their children. They are impoverishing their children and their ex-wife. And um, that's their future. Um, what they're trying to make is their past. So that's destroying their own bloodline. But that's how insane they are. And that's how the Uzbek top leadership has trained the Tajik victim population. It's all to the advantage of the Uzbek top uh, population. And they don't want competitors who are as smart and as healthy as they are. I see. Yeah. That's how they do it. So they set up social programs and social norms and, and uh, cultural practices that disadvantage the victim population and keep them trapped in that role uh, and limited um, while the, uh, the, the ruling population of Iranian Uzbek tribes, tribal people, um, are always on the top. But you see, they make all the rules. And look at all the Zionist rules that are happening now. Um, all of a sudden, something will come out like, um, They've hijacked the British throne now with Kate Middleton. And all of a sudden, as soon as she had that first baby, all of a sudden, David Cameron, the prime minister, passed a law that no one in the royal family is in the line of succession unless they are children of Prince Charles. So they just wiped out Elizabeth the first, the second, all of her other children and that whole bloodline. They're hijacking the bloodline. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, about bloodlines, I was very surprised that uh, in Holland, um, suddenly this girl from Argentina, Maxima, came because she sort of came from nowhere. And what I have heard since is that uh, this Pope, Franciscus, I call him Fascismus, but okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that he has rewritten her biography so she could marry Willem Alexander. Have you heard anything about that? Well, she's, she's from a breeding program also, although um, I haven't done the research on it yet. But um, she's not just nobody. She's from a breeding program. And remember that Argentina, um, much of the population is Italian. So I suspect that okay. she's from one of these Iranian bloodlines 
that mm. um, her origins have been hidden. And remember that her father was a fascist military officer involved in uh, the disappearance of many children and many people in Argentina. Um, but I would say Maxima is, is she has she's from some very special bloodline and breeding program. She's not just um, uh, someone who got to meet, you know, on a trip or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. That she was selected for him. It's the top Iranians who selected who he would marry, uh, just like uh, Prince William marrying Kate Middleton. Um, these are not accidents at all. These are very, very calculated. They're ruthless. They kill people to um, do this. And what you're going to see, because this is what they do, the, these top Iranian families, as soon as they get uh, one of their women to uh, intermarry with a king or a royal family, they wait until the children are born. And when they're uh, young children, all of a sudden the king is murdered or assassinated. And the uh, Iranian bloodline queen steps forward as the regent ruling for her own children until they're of age majority. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm a Bourbon. Uh, I'm descended from Henry IV, the first Bourbon king of France. Um, his cousin died without leaving any children, and Henri Quatre was the next one legitimately in line to succeed to the throne. But he was a Huguenot. His mother was Jeanne d'Albret, the Queen of Navarre, and she led the Huguenot movement, and your family was Huguenot also, in France. And she was... Um, a, a Catherine Medici, Medici, Med, Med is an Iranian tribe. She means the stock or the bloodline. So Catherine Medici was one of these Iranians from the, the Uzbek tribe. And she was very ruthless, very, very, very extremely cruel and ruthless. And she was married to one of the kings before, uh, the, uh, before Henri ascended to the throne and um, she uh, wanted her daughter Marie de Medici to marry Henry the fourth and he was uh, he had married a Valois woman a cousin um, but she was extremely scandalous and they didn't get along or like each other so um, so he decided he fell in love with an, another woman who he had three or four children with, and he was going to marry her. And the Pope of Rome agreed to dissolve the marriage, and um, there were no children. And um, so when he gave his coronation ring to his mistress, um, she suddenly was poisoned. And she was in, um, she was pregnant with her fourth child, and she was poisoned. And then uh, finally, Marie de Medici, uh, Henry IV, married her. They had a whole bunch of children, like five or six. He had a lot of illegitimate children, too. And um, all of a sudden, on the way, in, he was in his coach going to her coronation as Queen of France. And a Jesuit priest assassinated him in the uh, the carriage, and she became regent for her children, and um, and then um, children intermarried other royal families, and her daughter with Henri Henri the Fourth became Queen of Spain. So um, I'm descended from him and 65 kings of Europe came out of that Bourbon bloodline. Hmm. And and so you see that's how these families operate. As soon as they intermarry with a, a royal uh, and have children, uh, very often the royal is murdered. 
and then they get to bring up the children in their culture, their beliefs, that Iranian background, and uh, they're just as ruthless as their mothers. <laughs> yeah, well, or more so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it, it puts things in perspective. Um, and, and you know, John Kerry, who's Secretary of State now, he is a Huff Judah. Huff Judah means a house Jew. And his family, the house Jews, are the Jews who served and advised the royal families, the, the sovereigns, in different countries. He was a Huff Judah in Czechoslovakia to the Habsburg Empire. Okay. And he um, married a second woman after he divorced. He and his wife got divorced. And the woman he's married to, Teresa Hines Carey, she is also from a Portuguese Huff Judah family. So her family advised the uh, Portuguese and the Spanish court. And, um, and so you see they're tremendously, tremendously wealthy. Yeah, that, that comes with the job, huh? Right. But they are working for those Iranian families at the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if they do well in terms of what is expected from them, then they get rewarded. Yeah. That's right. And so you see, um, you see what you see why he's Secretary of State during this uh, this uh, attempted takeover or takeover of the Ukraine. Okay, so hoof Juden again. Yeah. And uh, then it, they then they manipulated through the World Bank and the um, IMF all these huge loans to the Ukraine, and the IMF and the World Bank will go in with their programs, and it's the satanic Tajik Jews who are running the the World Banks for the top Iranian families. So the World Bank and the IMF will um, buy, they will take, they will trade nature for debt. They have programs now with countries where they would trade nature for debt. And so what they're doing is incurring, loading countries with huge debts that they can never, ever, ever pay back. And then they will force them to give their natural resources and their land traded to the bank to um to to pay off the debt but it's all the commons that really belong to the people and not very long ago maybe two years ago um obama gave all of the water fresh water in lake superior to the chinese as a payment on interest on debt that the u.s owes china Oh, so that's why Nestle is uh, Nestle. bringing that over to China, that water. Okay. And Nestle has to be tied to the Jesuits also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have this, this um, flow chart uh, of the Club of the Isles. Yes. And that is um, Elizabeth and Philip on top, and then everything that has to do with natural resources and food and... Um, how you say that? Um, bringing stuff from one place to another, importing, Car importing, importing cargoing ships, whatever. It's it, they they own it all. <laughs> it is really yes, and they're going to control it all, and they're going to control it all through cell phones, uh, computers, internet, homeland security structures, um, offshore uh, banks of servers in international waters, because what they're doing is illegal on the continental US and other countries. And these uh, offshore servers that are um, sending and receiving data from whatever they're offshore from, they're hooked up to the Inmarsat satellites that were involved in the um, MH370 Malaysian flight that disappeared outside of Malaysia, but disappeared in Singapore airspace. And Singapore is the uh, uh, piece of land taken from Malaysia or cut out of Malaysia 
uh, that is the headquarters for the CIA and MI6 in Southeast Asia. Oh, okay. so they were involved, and there was a Singapore airplane flying just a couple miles behind MH17 when it was shot down over the Ukraine last July. And it's in Marsat that has all of the Homeland Security data and other government data on their satellite. They have a, a special satellite over the Cameroons in Africa. And all of our data is up there. And this is all connected to their headquarters in London. And they're putting uh, smart meters in. The smart meters and the cell phones are the mechanism to access individuals and individual data to give them commands to write algorithms for mind control and transmit it to their brains, so forth and so on. It's on their houses. And all of that data is sent every second to uh, in Marsat, and that goes through the Cameroon satellite into London. So do you, see, do you see this um, communications network that's being set up right now and I know about it because I live in Berkeley and it's the Lawrence Berkeley lab and the Los Alamos nuclear weapons lab and the U.S. government that are participating in setting it up. Well, it's interesting that you, you mentioned Inmarsat uh, satellites because I used to work as a uh, copywriter for business to business. And one of my clients was station 12. That was a, uh, satellite communication uh, organization uh, that came from uh, the uh, old-fashioned Scheveningen Radio. That was the world-famous radio station for all the ships all over the world. Yes. Yeah? Yes, so and Inmarsat tracks all ocean shipping, all yeah. of it. So Station 12 was the, 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 the new translation of Scheveningen Radio, but then to the next level, the satellite level. And so I, I, I wrote a lot of copy for them. Yes. And one of the things that I did was that I visited with the Dutch Army, communication center of the Dutch Army. And you know what? Station 12 <laughs> was written that they had a program, SAT Alert. And that program was written by the guys from the Dutch Army. And they paid Station 12 for uh, the communication costs, but they basically built the whole program themselves, our defense. Yeah. Uh, the, the Dutch Army. At the bottom of all of it. And the yeah. elites stand on two legs. They stand on organized crime and the military, and that's yeah. who keeps them on the throne or yeah. in the president's office. And as a result of the crashes that are unexplained of MH370, well, it was shot down by the U.S. Navy, who was doing exercises with 25 other militaries in Thailand when it was shot down over the South China Sea. In, air, in Singapore airspace. And uh, Inmarsat did this huge cover story and took it, took that plane all the way to Antarctica. <laughs> well, oh, they really? didn't have one satellite assigned to that, that plane. They couldn't possibly have. The, the satellites are in orbit. And yet they said one satellite followed it all the way down to South Africa and then to Antarctica. That's baloney. And, um, and so they were um, one of the main mechanisms to do the cover-up on MH370. And, and then MH17 happened. And now Inmarsat wants to put under contract all airplanes, all airlines, to track all travelers on planes and cargo. So okay. you see, this is the Jesuit centralized one source for everything uh, mechanism to control the population on the whole planet. And Indonesia had um, uh, the smart meters uh, 10 years before we got them in the United States. We haven't had them very long. 
Oh, wow. So this is all about tracking. And then I had roommates who were students on the Berkeley campus. And one of them said, oh, well, I was involved in a group of students who were uh, setting up a tracking system, a program. And um, it's funded by, the research was funded by the Department of Defense Information, which is military. They yeah. fund military-related research. And he said, we were told it was for tracking equipment for the military. He said, but that didn't really quite fit this program we wrote. Uh, he said it would have been much better for tracking people. <laughs> so it was, yeah. So that's what it was. So they're setting up these templates for tracking everything. Yeah. And our stat is... Of the headquarters for all of it. Hmm. Yeah, we are not supposed to go anywhere without everybody knowing where we are. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that um, when you come to to the states by airplane, then uh, they have this template. You have to put your head exactly into that template, and then. It's the biometrics that are being checked. And if something is off, oh gosh, then you really have a ball. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. So it said uh, the granularity is just getting um, more and more and more and more and more detailed. And I mean, they're going to they're gonna count every mole or freckle on your body and they'll know everything. Yeah. And your DNA. I mean, they oh, have absolutely. everybody's DNA and already. They track you from satellites, infrared satellites, yeah. uh, by your DNA. They don't need to put chips in people. The DNA exactly. has its own unique frequency that it transmits constantly from your body, from your DNA structures in the cell. And um, your frequency is unique. No one else in the world has that frequency. And I watched the UN um, doing this tracking, setting it up on animals, on life, um, uh, on life, life's living systems. And they went down the west coast of North, Central and South America. And I could tell where they were and what they were doing because all of a sudden there would be all these new species of frogs and this and that. Yes discovered yeah. in these countries and so mm -hmm. i knew exactly where they were and where they were going all the time i followed them for like two years which quadrants they were investigating yeah yes they were cataloging the populations and the species yeah yeah so the, the in the agenda 21 of the un it says very clearly that <coughs> um that there will be um, no more taken out from the system by a human being than what they put in. Yep. That the tracking uh, or the banking, the money and everything will be done from satellites. David Rockefeller even said that. He said everyone will have a number and their bank, their money is on the satellites. And if they don't do what we want them to do, we'll turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> There's so yeah. matter of fact about it. Yeah, it is, it's totally crazy. It's like a very, very bad, corny Hollywood film. <laughs> oh, it's just, it's so sloppy. It's so disgusting. It's so yes. immoral. It's so insane. Um, these people really, really need to be exterminated. And that's what you do in tribes in Central Asia. If a tribe is out to kill your tribe, I had Kazakh roommates, and they said, oh, if the tribe we were having trouble with was out to genocide us, we knew they were going to genocide us, we did it to them first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matter of time, who does, who does what oh, first? It was just matter of fact. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, yeah. A, it was a survival issue. Yes, it, that's what it is, yeah. And she said, one tribe that was bothering us, uh, we just slaughtered all of them. There were only 19 of them left when we got through with them. <laughs> well, 
I heard um, Benjamin Friedman. No, not Friedman. Benjamin. What's that guy in Japan? Benjamin something. Oh, Fulford. Fulford. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a Rockefeller. I know him well. And he's a Jesuit. He went to Sophia University in Tokyo. He's a psycho for the Rockefellers. He is a Rockefeller. Okay. Yeah, because that, yes. that figures. Because he had this creepy story about an Asian ninja. Uh, all garbage. It was all army something that would take out everybody one by one. Rothschild, Rockefeller, this, that, and the other. Uh, anything he says, the opposite is true. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, he's a Rockefeller. Okay. He's one of the um, the Zionists. He's a huge Zionist, and he went to Japan, and he was um, station chief for Forbes magazine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, for all of Southeast Asia, and this is when he was like 26 or 30 or something. Yeah, that's a red flag already. Yeah, uh, red flag right there. Yeah. Yeah. But but on his website, he's he's a Canadian Jew. He um, I saw his website, and he had a picture of his grandfather's house. He had a mansion in Canada, and his grandfather was one of the co-founders of General Electric. Well, the Rockefellers oh. own General Electric and they own Westinghouse. Oh, and, okay. So then we go to the nuclear energy and the plants and Fukushima yes, again. Yeah. Yes, and all of the, they're a big, 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 uh, the Rockefellers brought eugenics to the United States in the 1920s. Yes. From the from road, from Cecil Rhodes and that round table that, that he funded and uh, ran. Yeah, originally it, it was the nephew of um, uh, Darwin, Sir yes. Francis of God, Francis Galton, later Sir Francis Galton, who f created uh, Eugenics yes. by combining Malthus and uh, some other things. Darwin. I was actually much older than that, and um, Malthus was a British. I think he was a minister. Yeah. And um, he came up with this proposal, and I knew he'd gotten it from the Rothschilds, or what we call the New World Order now, um, that the world was overpopulated. Yes. It was in the period of the Age of Discovery, and this is when um, Europeans were exploring the world so they could loot it. And so that was part of the excuse for exterminating the indigenous people in the countries they were looting well we're overpopulated yeah and, but i found an even older um a czech man named cominus who um wrote about that and he wrote in his um article this is this is like in the 1400s um about um a need well he wrote this novel or a book or something and it was about people sitting around discussing the need to find a poison that would kill universally or globally no matter how far away they were and um so see that's the Habsburg empire and the jesuits again uh, and, um, and so depleted uranium fourth generation nuclear weapons, including neutron bombs, um, the chemtrails. These are all part of that global poison that they were dreaming about. Kaminas wrote about it in the 1400s, and that was the Hapsburg Empire. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Malthus was uh, something like 1826 or so, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Much later, but he was just... Um, an iteration of what had been said and, and passed around for a long time. Yeah. Long time. In okay. fact, we might have even been talking about that in uh, Assyria and Sumeria and uh, the very, very early life in, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also was talking to some Iranians and uh, about these these Iranian, top Iranian leaders of the Jesuits. 
And they weren't really that surprised. They were the ones, in fact, who said that Stalin was Iranian. So I came home and looked it up, and he sure was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he started out as a tailor. And um, and he looked like uh, I married an Iranian and lived in Iran for a while. So I'm familiar with the culture and, and the people. And Stalin looked just exactly like any other y- young Iranian Iranian guy. Um, he didn't look that way when he was the head of Russia. But why was he put in, installed as the head of Russia? He had a specific purpose. And I believe that Russia for a long time has been controlled by these Iranian tribes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we have not very much time, but there's two things that I'd like you to say something about. Um, You wrote to me that you photographed very strange chemtrails uh, in the Francis, uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, a couple of days ago. Yes. And there was, there there strange was. dirty clouds and stuff. So can you tell me about that a bit? Yes. Um, uh, we were out in the San Francisco Bay Area on, I believe it was March 1st. It might have been February 28th. It was Saturday or Sunday last weekend. And um, we always carry cameras with us. And um, we stay in as much as we can since Fukushima happened. We don't like to go outside and never, ever, ever, if possible, in rain or fog or uh, moist air because yeah. the radiation is coming down in that moisture. Yeah. And um, so I was standing on the BART platform and the, there were these big puff clouds that were intermittent showers coming in off of the ocean they were beautiful they each one looked like a volcano Mm. oh did i lose you you froze what is happening well it's about chemtrails. Maybe we're not supposed to talk about that. What can we do now? Ah, yes. How do I tell her in the chat? Um, yeah. Loren, you need to log out and come back in. Okay, well, chemtrails here were strange also in the Netherlands yesterday. At the end of the day, um, there were these huge pink streaks in the air. And these were all chemtrails that were lighted by the sun. But they were very, very pink. It was a very crazy sight. I was driving my car so I couldn't take a picture, but otherwise I would have done it because I have a large collection of chemtrail pictures because in the last couple of years they get weirder and weirder. Well, I hope we get Loren back. I'm not sure because I don't see anything happening. Knowing Loren, she will try. Log in again. Wow. Anyway. um, Well, then the only thing that I can do is, is fill you in on what is happening in... In... Um, Fukushima terms, um, and that is that I keep checking the website of Dana Dernford, the professional diver in Canada, uh, and his 
um, website is the nuclear proctologist.org and you can see there how the titles of that coastal area, the British Columbia coastline, uh, the tidal pools would usually usually teem with life being the the birthing chamber of of the ocean and Today, of the 5,000 5, plus species that are there, there are only five or 15, maybe, sometimes. And also, people have seen um, whales with wounds, and also sea lions um, have been seen on TV news. Dead sea lions, pups on the beach of Malibu, missing hair, open raw patches of skin on their bodies and other signs of radiation caused deaths. And Dana mentioned also that it is very eerie in British Columbia coastal waters right now because when you're at the coast, you cannot hear the whales or orcas singing anymore. It is a dead silence. And also people, uh, when they drive their cars, have no insects on the windshields anymore. So there are no insects. And when there are no insects, there will be less birds. And the other day I was on the beach in the Netherlands and it was nice weather. We were taking a walk and I saw one seagull. So I put a message on Facebook about that. And then all sorts of people said, yeah, we see, we see seagulls, but they were inland. So I haven't been back at the beach yet, but the next time I'll be there, I will pay attention whether I see seagulls again, because there was even a fishing boat going through the water. And usually he had a net behind the, the boat. And usually you see seagulls then flying around that, but none, not one. So I found that very crazy, very peculiar. And next time I go to the beach, I will bring the Inspector Plus radiation, uh, what is it called? Radiation alert. And... Um, see what is happening there, because it might be that Fukushima's radiation has reached the Dutch shores also. I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if it has happened, because Fukushima is pumping radiated water 24-7 into the ocean, and apparently leaking fuel pouring pool, fuel pools of spent fuel on the roof of reactor 2 are leaking directly into the ocean and have been doing that for some time, some time already. So, yeah, I'm quite curious about how that's going to work out. It's, it is bad news because we cannot survive radiation. Um, I heard that the Dutch government has been talking about... Um, iodide in pills for the population. So what are they not telling us really? Um, what do they know that we don't know yet? I'm very curious about that. I have no clue. Well, it doesn't look like Loren is coming back I don't know what happened but if her computer froze that means that it might take a while to start up again and then I don't know how much time we will have after 10 o'clock uh, that it will be in seven minutes so um, yeah 
we, um, I will call it a day then, in other words, because yes, there is going to be a show after this one. And without having Lauren here, it's not so nice. Being on my own is not so nice. So, dear listeners, dear viewers, um, this was the minority of one report of March 8, 2015. And thank you, Biggie, for the technical support and Mel. Um, kisses for both of you. And till next time, this is Dave Ray Rover from the Netherlands. Bye-bye.